Praise be to God. I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah and that Jesus Christ is his only son, a prophet and savior of the world. That there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ the only Son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you, and God be glorified. And as Paul said, I am, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Hallelujah. We're going to continue in this series, The Inexhaustible Love of God. Look to your neighbor and say, The Inexhaustible Love of God. And we're going to take our scripture from Mark chapter 11, reading verse 24 through 26. And that would be supplicant scriptures you may want to make a note down for, and that would be Romans chapter 8, verses 28. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, and Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. And we will hit and miss on most of those, but as you move forward, you can read them at your leisure. And if we go to Mark chapter 11, verse 24 through 26, and it reads, and it says, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever thing, what thing soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye pray standing, when ye stand praying, Forgive if ye have aught against any, that the Father also which is in heaven may forgive you of your trespassing. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you of your trespasses. If you please, can you go to the right to Romans chapter 8, verses 27. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. It is a familiar passage. And it reads and it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purposes. And I'm going to use for a text this morning, God's love is forgiving. Subtext, as God forgive you, you must forgive others. As God forgive you, you must Forgive others. Now, in Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35, we will extract some meat out of that. Is that Peter asked Jesus a question. He said, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus said unto him, No, till seventy times seven, which equal four hundred and ninety times a day. Then Jesus told the story of the wicked servant who owed a man ten thousand talents. And 
the king at that time forgave him of all that he owed. And this same wicked servant went out and found the man that owed him a hundred pence. And he forced the man to pay him, and if he didn't pay him, he would lock him up in jail, as the story goes, and you can read more about it. But when the king found out about it, that the man that he forgave the most went out and did the opposite of the man that only owed him a hundred pence. Therefore, the king decided to lock him up until he paid everything that he owed the king. So the narrative, if you please, the content of that particular story in Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35, is all about forgiving. It's all about being willing to forgive. Now, the word forgive means to stop feelings of anger or resentment toward someone for an offense. How many of you in here has ever been offended by someone? Most of us have been offended. And it is an ought against someone for an offense. You may have to forgive someone of a flaw that they may have. You may have to forgive someone for making a mistake that hurt you. You also understand that the word forgive means to pardon. There are some people that you have to pardon. I know in the United States, the president of the United States, I believe annually, have to decide who he want to pardon, who he want to forgive. And normally they do it through the criminal justice system where they may pardon someone that was locked up for reason that was not necessary. So the word forgive means pardon. It means to excuse. It means to exonerate. But there's a couple other words that I think fit more of the Christ kingdom. And these are words for forgive and one of them is grace. Grace. So when God forgave us of our sins, he pardoned us. He exonerated us. He excused us. He graced us. And another word is mercy. He didn't punish us when he should have, and he graced us with his unmerited favor. Now, what does this mean, preacher? What does this mean when it comes to daily living? Know this, as God has already forgiven you, you must be ready and willing to forgive others. You see, in order to truly live, you must be ready to forgive. There's no such thing as saying that I'm over it and it's, it's done now. It didn't happen and I forgave them a long time ago and, and you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm past that. What I've come to learn in my own personal life, some things that I thought I was past, I was nowhere near past them. It was what I call word or verbal forgiveness. Verbal forgiveness is something you say, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it comes from your heart. You can have confession without possession. You can say you forgive someone, but in your heart you still have ought against them. It's kind of like being a passive-aggressive. Well, you say, no, that don't bother me. That's okay. But in your heart, you hold on to stuff because it still makes you angry when you think about it. And we have a church full of people 
not just in this church, but all over where they are passive aggressive. They say words to get by while being locked down in their heart. You know, they said, that didn't bother me. I'm over that girl. That's good. Come on now. That was a few years ago. But what they don't tell you is that in their heart, they have put up blocks. They have blocked you out. They've told you you'll never get that close to me again. They have allowed themselves to use expensive words without having the melody of forgiveness in their hearts. And therefore, when God looks at you, you know the word said man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. He hears your song in your heart. And your song is playing, that'll never happen to me again. I'll never be that close to you again. I'll never allow you to hurt me or to wound me again. But see, Jesus didn't do us that way. Those that hurt him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they what? Know not what they do. Even though they, in their heart, was malicious about it. But how many of you know that sometimes people can hurt you, but they don't see the big picture? All they see is what they're doing to you at the time. <clears throat> but this message is to restore you and to let you know it's okay. You may not be there yet. You may have some folks that you not only don't want to forgive, but you prefer that they just disappear because of the pain that it's caused you. You will know that when you have been born for something great, you will know when you have been born for something great. Can somebody say something great? When you've been born for something great, the enemy will attack you as a child. When you've been born for something great, when you've been born to do great things, when you've been born to go great places, when you've been born to do the things that God has put into you, the enemy will attack you as a child. He would attack you as a child because the Bible has already given us information for that. We can talk about Moses, we can talk about Jesus, we can talk about John the Baptist, we can talk about most of your great kings that in their childhood they had to learn to grow up forgiving others. And I'm here this morning to tell you that if the devil has been trying to hit you when you was a child. He was completely afraid of you as an adult because he know that if he couldn't stop you as a child, he know he's going to have some problems on his hand when you finally line up into the purpose of which God has brought you through. Come on, give God a hand praise in the house of God. I want you to know that those of you that, that, have, that have been in the bathtub of pain, Maybe you showered with pain. Maybe the water that's coming out of the faucet is nothing but blood. Maybe your mind and the residue that you have within yourself is all wallowing in pain. Yes, maybe you are in the odious silence of, of pain and unforgiveness. Maybe you forgave, but you really didn't forgive because it wasn't coming from your heart. Maybe you just said some nice words in order to relieve the pain. But church, God is looking at your heart. Ephesians 4 and 32 says, And be kind one to another. <laughs> Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even 
as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. One of the most interesting pieces about that verse, it says, be kind to those that hurt you. Be tenderhearted to those that tried to kill you. Be merciful for those that didn't mean you any good. Tenderhearted. Reminding yourself as God for Jesus Christ's sake has, past tense, forgiven you. It's easy to try to forgive someone with an arrogant spirit like that's what I'm going to do for right now, but it's going to take me some time. I've come to find out that there are some things you got to do now, and if you need to go and cry about it, if you need to find a closet or a place where you can get in the closet and empty yourself out about it, then that's what you need to do because when you do not truly forgive, your prayers become a stench unto God. When you don't truly forgive, you cut off God's hands for giving you reciprocity. And we all want reciprocity, amen? amen. Let's go in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The last thing the enemy wants is you to forgive. But true forgiveness comes from the heart. I got to have a heart to forgive. If my heart is not right, all I'm doing is just talking. 2 Corinthians 4 and 8 says, We are troubled on every side, but yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Now, that simply means that this is what people will do to you. People will perplex you. People will cast you down. People will lie on you. People will persecute you. This is what people will do to you. But we got to know that God has a way out for us. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. What the devil means for bad, God will turn to good. And I find this scripture to be very exciting because it gives me something to do. It simply says, we must examine your own selves, whether ye be in the faith. Then he says, prove your own selves. Then he says, know ye not your own selves. Anytime we hear something being read or being said two or more times, we know that we need to pay attention to that. We need to understand that the writer here is telling me to look inwardly and not outwardly at what people are doing to me. So he said, examine your own selves whether ye be in the faith. In other words, are you truly saved? Then it said, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you. Except ye be what? Reprobates. Now what does that mean, preacher? That means that I live in a world where pain can be expected. I live in a world where I may experience spiritual shock and awe when pain comes from those that I love. 
I live in a world where my expectation is for the world to treat me bad. I live in a world where my expectation is for the world to lie on me. My expectation is for the world to act like the world. My expectation is for the world to do what the world do. I live in a world where I can openly embrace the world's pain. But what makes it so difficult for us as kingdom citizens and children of God is when we receive the same pain from brothers and sisters in the church. But we still have to do what? Forgive. You got to find a way to forgive somebody. Matthew 18 and 35 says, talks about true forgiveness is a hard issue. I didn't say a hard issue. It's a hard issue. It's not just saying words out of your mouth. So the reason why maybe your prayers are not coming to fruition is because God knows that you got some unforgiveness in your heart. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 35. I want you to read it for yourself. Because in that story, Jesus was telling this story so that we could get an understanding. Sometimes we say, well, I forgave her or I forgive them and I'm letting it go. But that is conversation with our mouths. But if you say it and what comes out of your mouth is not in your heart, you are just making a verbal confession without a change of your heart. And when God hear you make a verbal confession without a true change in your heart, he goes microscopically to your heart and there will he bless you according to your heart. The scripture says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We go by what we hear people say, but God go beyond what you say, and he hears it from a heart position. We said that's past and that's over with. And I'm here to tell you as an example, there's some things that you may have thought you letting go. But what they can do is get woven into your personality. And you are reacting to things that have been done 20 years ago. You have allowed yourself to have a victim stance. You've allowed yourself to operate your mind from a cognitive position of being a victim. You just have allowed yourself to say that I'm going to deal with this situation based upon what has already happened to me. And God told me to tell you that he needs you to go deeper into your pain. You need to just dig as deep as you can into your pain because all of the answers you're looking for is in the midst of your pain. And you can't find true forgiveness until you learn how to go deep into your pain and find the core of that thing that has been holding you back, that thing that has been keeping you from being what you know God needs for you to be. You may have to go back to that abuse, back to that misuse, back to the lies that was told, back to how they talked about you. You may have to go back and search in your heart Examine yourself, prove yourself to see if you are truly of the faith. Because when you don't do that, you can be masquerading like everything is okay, but in your heart, you're dying on the inside. In your heart, you have this odious pain. In your heart, you have this toxicity. 
that you refuse to let go because you will not forgive. Look to your neighbor and say, I got to forgive. So in this church, I had to do some soul searching myself. 2 Corinthians 2 and 13 and 5 says, examine your own selves, whether ye be of the faith. See, you say, but are you of the faith? Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves. I love it how the writer is writing this. How he said, know yourself. Look to your neighbor and say, do you know yourself? So you got it. How that Jesus Christ is in you. See, if he's in you, there cannot be any unforgiveness in you. If he's in you, you can't be holding aught against your brother and your sister, if he's in you, if he's in you, you should be able to smile all the time. There should be something about you that draws people to you. If he's in you, you shouldn't be depressed all the time. If he's in you, you shouldn't be mad and sad all the time. If Jesus Christ is in you, you should be a light like moth flowing to the flame. People should be attracted to you because of the Jesus that's in you. If he's in you, that means that you have, should have already forgave people from a heart level. If he's really in you, you shouldn't be in pain all the time. Your bones should not be stiff. You shouldn't be cracking as you walk and everything. You should have been and got rid of some stuff because if he's in you, if he's in you, there should be some joy about you. If he's in you, there should be some peace about you. If he's in you, there should be some love about you. If he's in you. There should be something about you that draws people to you, not repel people from you. I'm here to tell you, church, the reason why some of us don't have it is because we're still walking around with the pain. Yes, that's what I said, the pain of unforgiveness. You're still mad at people that done you wrong and you have not letting it go. Well, I'm going to give you... Ten things I want you to consider. They're called my monuments of those I had to forgive. My monuments of those I had to forgive. And maybe you want to write down your monuments of people that you had to forgive. That, that if you didn't forgive them, the stuff they did to you would destroy your life. Now, now, now church, uh, I am not talking about what you say out of your mouth. I'm talking about a heart issue. I'm talking about getting by yourself. I'm talking about talking to yourself and said, have I really let that go? Have I, have I let it go? <laughs> have, I, have I let it go? And, and, and if you have not let it go, I'm here to tell you, church, that, that your whole life is being propelled by your pain. Your whole life is being propelled by your pain. You're making decisions based upon your pain. You're making decisions based upon past hurts. You're making decisions based upon what they said, what they didn't say, what they did, what they should have did. You're making decisions from a victimization mentality because you have chosen not to forgive. You've let words come out your mouth, so... I'm going to share with you some people that I had to forgive. I, I labeled them my monuments of those I had to forgive. How many of you got some people that you know you had to forgive? And, and, and if you would be true about it, most of the time we start out by letting our mouth say it. And, and, and I have to tell people all the time, it first start with your mouth. You got to be quick to forgive, quick to love, and quick to repent. But you need to be working on that thing once it come up out your mouth. Will the church say amen? Hallelujah. Got to be quick to forgive. When you are quick to forgive, then God can be quick to love. God can be quick to love. See, I anticipated on the devil. I told my wife to go and get me a battery. I anticipated on the devil because he don't want you to hear what you need to hear. 
Now, see, he mad now. But how many of you know that it's all good? I just knew the devil was going to try to work with the battery this morning. So the point that I'm trying to get you to understand is that the enemy does not want you to forgive. He, 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 he loves it when you hold alt. But one thing after digging into this text, many times when you think you have let, let stuff go, it can, it can come back on you in the most prime time of your life. You know how we hear about people committing suicide? It's because they didn't deal with the pain. How people are saying that, you know, well, when did that happen to you? That happened 20 years ago, but their whole life has been based upon what has happened to them. And what has happened to them has now become them. And you got to ask yourself the question, you know, we don't want to pretend that that is over with. We, we don't want to pretend that that is by me now. We want to be real with the pain. We want to be real with those that have hurt us. And when you are real with it, when it gets to the point where you now know is past me, there's something about you that just changed. As I do this roll call, Maybe you can think of your roll call. You know how we like to pretend like that didn't bother me. I mean, we're good at being hypocrites. The word hypocrite means actor. We've learned how to put faces on. We can be in the most excruciating pain, but we'll say, I'm all right. We've learned how to speak Christian needs. We've learned how to, when we're around others, we've learned how to put our chest out and walk with swag like we got it all together while dying on the inside. I've learned that there's some, some time it's good to go back to look at what you came through. I got monuments in my house about the pain that I've been through, but these are just a few a few. A few monuments that I hope will help you. That when you examine yourself, as 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 says, examine yourself, whether ye be of the faith. Because if you're a Christian, you need to examine yourself. You need to look at yourself. Am I really who I say I am? Do I really believe what I say I believe? Do I really walk like I need to walk? Do I really talk like I need to talk? Am I really saved? Am I really saved? Do I really love God? And if I really love God, then how do I manifest my love to myself and to others? Have I truly forgiven everyone? So to examine myself, I learned, number one, I had to forgive my father. On my roll call, I had to forgive my father because my father was never there for me. My father totally rejected me. My father's never done anything for me in his whole entire life. My father was a man that birthed me but never checked on me. Never came by the house and said, come on, son, let's... Let's go for a ride. My father lived 10 minutes away, but he was a lifetime apart. I had to go back and search through the pain. I had to go back and look at myself and tell myself, am I, am I through with it? Is there any psychological residue is there anything that can linger on and that will cause me to treat my children like my father treated me and just imagine never bought me an ice cream cone never never bought me a pair of shoes never said good job son never said any of that 
And if you're not careful, the enemy will rewind your life from when you felt the most rejection and pain. And he will try to use that against you when you're getting ready to make great gains in your life. And this is why you wonder why. Well, why do some people are doing crazy stuff and they get all that money and they get all this here. That's because they have a root of bitterness. They got a root of unforgiveness and they got the pain that they have not processed. Well, church, I had to go through it, but it was for my good. You see, God love is forgiving. And as God has forgiven me, I had to also to forgive my father. I had to forgive him from a heart, not just saying it. I had to forgive him from a heart position. So God would have me to tell you, examine yourself. Check your monuments of unforgiveness. Number two, I had to forgive those that abused me, misused me, talked about me, lied on me, treated me like a dog from the ages of six through ten years old. How many of you have been messed up at an early age? Remember, if the devil come for you early, that means greatness is for you later. If you can learn to get through the pain early, that's why you heard me say a lot, I prefer you go through it early because going through it late is too excruciating. How many of you have had somebody treated you bad when you was young, real young, and they treated you like a dog? Most of my pain in my informative years from 6 to 10 treated me bad and I had to learn to forgive. I don't know about you, but from time to time, when you rewind and go back to 6 and 7 and 8, you have more of a clear view of those who hurt you, of those who caused you pain. But look to your neighbor and say, I had to go through it. Talk to me, church. Say, I had to go through it. But it was for my good. What God wants you to know, you had to go through it, but it was for your good because God love is forgiving. And as God has forgiven you, you must be willing to forgive others. Number three, I had to forgive my fourth grade teacher. My fourth grade teacher caught me at a moment where I was deficient, different and deficient. Went to school with no shoes on. Everybody laughing at me while I'm in school. Have you ever seen a child that was poor, but not only poor, but look poor? And Miss Moore I remember her name vividly. Miss Moore would take me to the side and say, son, you just can't learn. Now, what she didn't know was she was toxifying me. She was telling me that you're not going to amount to anything. You, you know, you're stupid. You're a stutterer. You're not going to be anything, boy. So why don't you run behind and follow that janitor because that's going to be your, your position in life. Look to your neighbor and say, I had to go through it but it was for my good. You see, the point I'm trying to get you is that when the devil come to you early, God has great greatness for you later. You know, when, you, when you're trying to talk and it's I, top, 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 you can't get worse out and people laughing at you. When you're walking to school with no shoes on, when everything coming around you seem to be bad and they're making fun of you, just look to your name and say, I had to go through it, but it was for my good. How many of you in here today had to go through some stuff that was crazy? But when you look back on it, you realize that it was for your good. Roll call number four. I had to forgive my mother who sent me off when I was 15, turning 16. Sent me off to Waukegan and I was wrestling with some stuff like, Mama, why are you sending me? You know how it is when a son don't want to disconnect from the mother. 
He was letting, she was sending me off that I thought was bad. But how many of you know that your parents can see down the road? She sent me off and I got up in a place where people were doing crazy stuff and violence and drugs and crime and, and all of this stuff. But God sent me to that place. You see, I had to go through it. Can somebody say I had to go through it? But it was for my good. You see, unless you go back and check your areas, you will think it's over. But the devil will rewind it like it's playing back right now. All I'm trying to get you to understand is that everything you've been through, you had to go through it. All of the pain you've been in, you had to go through it. Can the church say, but it was for my good? I can't hear you, church. You, you talking like you haven't been through anything. See, when you really had to go through it, you know that it was for your good. So I had to learn to forgive my mother. There are some of you in here right now, maybe you need to forgive your mother and your father. Maybe your sisters and your brothers. And you pretend like it's okay. You pretend like it's all right when they don't call you. You pretend like it's all right that uh, when things don't work out. You pretend that it's past, but God told me to tell you, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay to embrace the pain. It's okay to recognize that even though you have forgave them, they may not have forgiven you. But just say I had to go through it. But it was for my good. Number five, I had to forgive family members. I don't know about you, but most of my pain came from family members and church folks. You see, the devil loves how, love to get family to hurt you. Because when family members hurt you, it stays for a lifetime. But see, you got to learn how to forgive. And I'm not just talking about talking about, all right, Sister Mary, uh, Brother Jim, I forgive you. No, I'm talking about heart issues. When you forgive from your heart, then when they see you, they see you from a heart position. They don't see no toxic residue of pain. They don't see it. So when Jesus came and walked the earth for 40 days and 40 nights and was seen by 500 brethren, did you not know that the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, and all of those saw him, but they didn't see his unforgiveness toward them. They saw a man that had already forgiven them because Jesus was merely letting them know, I had to go through it, but it was for y'all good. So your family members can hurt you. Number six, I had to forgive my college professor who told me that I didn't deserve to be at a private college. He said, this college don't need to have your kind here. And he rewind me back to Miss Moore who told me I couldn't learn. You see how the dots connect. How many hear what God is telling you? How the dots connect. He rewind to Miss Moore, and I began to feel apprehensive. I began to feel like I felt in the fourth grade. See, a lot of times you think you passed it, but all it takes is one incident to rewind you back to it. You got to understand that when you are past it, when the devil try to connect it back to what happened to you, there is no connection. And you find yourself knowing I'm past it now. And the devil don't want you past it, so he wants you to masquerade like you forgave, folks. But in your heart, in your heart, you're still hanging on to what they said, what they did, or what they should have done. So this professor said, you, you're dumb. You, you shouldn't be at this college. We don't even know why you're here. 
And I went on later to, to, to win most outstanding student athlete. Got A's and B's in that quarter. Isn't it amazing what people can do to you that can bring out the best in you? Will the church say amen? amen. Say, I had to go through it. Come on, talk to him and say, I had to go through it. Now, there's some of you going through some stuff right now, and, and you're mad about it. But I'm here to tell you that the sooner you go through it, the quicker it's going to be for your good. Will the church say amen? amen? Number seven, I had to forgive some wicked people on my job. I mean, some folks that was out to get me, out to scheme to try to hurt me. How many of you know that when people come at you on your job and you grown and you got family, they're not just coming at you. They're coming at your whole family. So when the devil try to come at you on your job, you got to know that he ain't coming at you alone. He's coming at your family. That's why you got to be quick to forgive, quick to, to love, and, and quick to repent. That's why on your job you can't say everything to everybody because you got to be thinking about your kids. Somebody say amen. You need to be thinking about your wife. You need to be thinking about your husband. You can't just go on your job and run your mouth and flapping off at the lip like somehow you running something. And the devil is a lie. You got to make it up in your mind that it's not just about me, but it's about my family. It's about my son. It's about my daughter. It's about my kids. You got to know how to shake some stuff off in your life and don't let the devil get you to a point where you're operating out of bitterness and pain, you got to know how to forgive. You got to know how to let some stuff go. Look to your neighbor and say, I had to go through it. But it was for my good. You know, the enemy think he got you down. He think he beating you up. But what he don't know is that he's strengthening you. What he don't know is that he's exercising your muscles. He's increasing them, pro them biceps. He's getting them traps ready. He don't realize that you had to go through it. Somebody say amen. You had to go through the hell that you're going through. You had to go through the pain that you're going through. But look to your neighbor and say, it was for my good. Let him talk about you. Let them lie on you, them wicked people, they lie on you. They'll try to make you think you're stupid. One thing that I learned that the devil, he'll attack your family. He'll get your family to come at you. They'll play, play mess with you. Then he'll get education to come at you. He'll try to make you stupid, you're dumb. And then he'll get your career coming at you. What the devil is trying to do is flip you from God. But you got to tell that devil, I'm going to flip these people for Jesus. Somebody say amen. Yeah, I had, I had to go through it. I had to learn to forgive people that hurt me. I had to learn. I had to learn that the answer was truly in the pain. I don't know about you, but I know in my job, you had people that were scheming and plotting and, and tipping and slipping and hiding and lying and doing everything they kid. They, you know, they're sending dogs to get bones and to carry bones. And you got double agents. And, and I have to tell my daughter, and as I tell these young folks all the time, when you at work, trust nobody, nobody, nobody. You don't trust nobody because the one you trust the most will betray you the most. You got to know you can't trust nobody but God. You can't trust nothing but God because people will throw stuff at you to try to hurt you. Now you're walking around with pain of unforgiveness because they came for your heart. Will the church say amen? So I had to forgive. I had to forgive those wicked people on my job. And just in case they hear this message, you know who you are. Somebody say amen. You see how they try to hurt you, you see, but I had to go through it. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was for my good, uh-huh. I had to go through it. Sometimes you just, you just have to grin and bear it. I, I had to go through it. I, you know, when they talk about you, you just, <laughs> you just have to go through it. It, 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 may not, it may not feel right, may not be right at the time, but, but it was for my good. You got to learn how to forgive people that hurt you. 
do good to people that despitefully use you. You got to learn how to love your enemy. Somebody say amen. Because when you do that, it, you had to go through it, but it's going to be what? For your good. Will the church say amen? Number eight, I had to forgive some church leaders and some church folks. You know, as pastor, the last thing you think is that you mean pastor, you got to forgive church leaders and church folks. Yes, I, I had to forgive some folks. I, I had, to be, had to be quick in doing it because the tendency sometimes is that people think that the pastor can just absorb anything. They think the pastor can take a hit. He can take a, he can take a kicking and a licking and keep on ticking. But what they don't understand is that every time somebody leaves the church, the pastor feel that. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. Every time somebody decides that they don't want to be a part of the ministry, the pastor, he feels that it's, it's, a kick to the, it's a kick to the gut. Every time the pastor gets word that somebody is sick and in the hospital, he feels that. Every time the pastor feels, get something where people are talking about him, lying on him, he feels that it's kind of like being crucified with Christ all over again. Every time the pastor get word that people don't care about what the church is doing, he feel it. He may even feel it in his toes. He, he may feel it in his knees, his ankles. Uh, he feels that. But the tendency sometimes church is that sometimes church members and people that go to certain churches in different places, they don't see it from the shepherd's position. All they see it is from a sheep and a goat position. They don't see it from how the shepherd feels that the, when you leave, when you do crazy stuff that the shepherd didn't want you to do, he feels that. He feels the pain of you not doing what he know you need to do. He feels the blunt. He feels the, he feels the excruciating pain that goes in his mind. He, he feels that. You look at it as being something that's nothing, but you don't understand that every time the preacher preach, he not only preached to himself, but he preached to you. So many times pastors can walk around and be in the pulpit with the odious silence of bitterness from what people not doing versus what they should do because he feel that. So sometimes, hear me church, sometimes pastors have to get on their knees and say, God, I need you to help me to forgive folks that I know that didn't have the ministry in their heart that I know that didn't have the vision in their heart, that I know that was playing games with the house of God. The pastors have to learn how to go to God and empty out themselves and tell God, forgive me for holding alt. Forgive me for not loving like I could. Why? Because they had to go through it. But it was for their good. What I'm trying to tell you, church, sometimes you don't see it from a shepherd's position. And the shepherd would be truly honest. They would tell you that sometimes people get on their nerve. Sometimes sheep get on their nerves. Sometimes they, they just get on their nerve because they know what to do but refuse to do it. When the vision is trying to propel forward, you got people relaxing and laying down. And don't want to do anything. So the shepherd, the shepherd, the shepherd had to guard his heart. <laughs> he had to be tender hearted to sheep that he know got canines in their mouth but refused to eat the food. Or the shepherd had to be tender hearted to sheep that spend most of their time whining about how bad life is but won't do nothing to improve their lives. Or the shepherd had to be tender hearted. I cannot talk to you for a moment. The shepherd had to be tender hearted because sometimes your expectation is for people to be at a certain level, but they spend most of their time eating crumbs when they should be eating food. The shepherd had to be tender hearted so we can't go through the odious pain of unforgiveness. So I had to learn to forgive church folks. I had to learn to forgive church members. I had to learn to forgive certain pastors and elders. I had to learn to forgive them, and you know, and how sometimes pastors, we get together, and how's it going over there? It's going fine. Are you all right? Man, I'm just fine. Everything going fine. But how many of you know that in the closet of his house, in that secret place, in that place where just him and God, you'll be stunned at his prayer. 
in that place where he asked God, am I doing the right thing? Should I do more? What else do I need to do? How else do I need to go? What direction do you want me to go in? Am I loving more? Do I call them? Do I visit them when they're sick? Am I doing what I need to do? And God checks it off and says, you're doing all you need to do. But why aren't, why aren't they responding? And God says, because some have ought in their heart. And if they have ought in their heart of unforgiveness, it's hard to respond when you're allowing your pain to control you. It's hard to respond to people that are trying to love you when you don't love yourself. It's hard to respond to someone that loving you when you got unforgiveness in your heart about your father. You see me as pastor, but some of you probably see me as father. And if you got an issue with your father, most likely you're going to have an issue with me. You see co-pastor and you may see her as a mother. And if you got an issue with your mother, the likelihood is you're going to have an issue with her. So until you learn to forgive those that have wounded you, those that have hurt you, those that sought to kill you, until you learn to forgive, you won't be that much use for anybody. Because even your best day will be anchored in unforgiveness. So as pastor, I have to learn how to forgive folks that just don't know what a pastor really does. Oh, they think they do, but they don't understand. So I have to learn to forgive people in the church. But see, I had to go through it, but it was for my good. Number eight, I had to forgive. Number nine, I had to forgive my haters and so-called friends. How many of you out there got some haters? See, if you got some haters, that means you're on the right road. If you don't have haters, that means you're probably not doing that much. I had to forgive the haters. Now, these haters know my struggle. They know what I've been through, but they're mad at me because, because the devil couldn't stop it. I got some haters right now that wish the church would close down. I got some haters right now that's sitting back watching. I mean, they looking. I got some haters that come up to me and say, are y'all still there? I got some haters asking me questions, is the church still open? I got some haters talking to me saying, how many y'all got? I got some haters. I got some haters. I got some people that wish the church door would close up. I got some haters that sit back, relax, and wait on stuff to fall. I had some Christian haters that would refuse to pay their tithe and give their offering, hoping that the doors would close. But I'm here today to tell you, church, if God be for you, who can be against you? What the devil meant for bad, God has turned to good. I had, I had, I had to go through it, but it was for my good. Or oh, they'll sit back and watch it. How long are they going to be married? How long he going to have his job? What's going to come up next? Them haters, them haters. I mean, they're all out there. They pose as your friend. They pose as your comrade. They pose as sister girl. They pose as bro man. They pose as your partner, your rappy, your homie, your ride, your dog, your friend. They pose at all that. But while they're posing, they're hoping that you die, hoping that you lose it all. Let's give the haters a praise for their hating and give God the victory for being victorious. If you ain't got no haters, you ain't doing too much. I mean, they'll sit back and hope you fail. 
I have some come up, come up to me and tell me, how you doing, Pastor Curry? You know, and, 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 and here's how you know they hating. How you doing, Pastor Curry? And give you this fake uh, statement. Are you all right? Well, of course I'm all right. What about you to ask me, am I right? Do I look like I'm sick? Do I look like I'm hungry? Do I look like I'm frustrated? Why would you ask me that question? Now, I know the reason why you would ask me that question. The reason why you would ask me that question because you have sown so much poison into me that now you're looking to see the effects of the poison that you have poured upon me. You've talked about me so much you thought that it would get to me. You lied on me so much that you thought I would be dead by now. You talked about the church. You put poison about the church. You, you went out and did everything you can do to try to stop me. So when you ask me this question, am I all right? My answer and respond to you, of course I am all right. So when you see your haters, just smile at them. For the young people, haters are people that are jealous of you. They, they are jealous of you. Have you ever showed up somewhere and when you showed up, a bunch of people was in the room and they start looking at you funny? I'm talking about people that maybe at a workplace. And when you show up, they look at you funny. And you always try to figure out why they look at me like that. Why do they always, when I show up, they start to act different? Have you ever walked in a room and you sensed that they was talking about you? And when you walked in, they became silent. All I'm trying to tell you, church, is that your spirit is filled with the Holy Ghost. When you show up, their spirit gets intimidated by your spirit. See, you think it's face to face, but it's spirit to spirit. Let me say it again. You think it's face to face, but it's spirit to spirit. If you have a strong, assertive, confident spirit, and they have a weak, intimidating spirit. Weak people normally do things on the down low. Strong people normally do things boldly and out front. So every time you show up, they get intimidated, not by your face, but by your spirit. So them demons are saying, here comes something that we don't recognize. And many of you in here had to forgive some church folks. Raise your hand if you had to forgive some church folks. Most Christians, the most pain we get is from each other. But we here at Congress Christian Center, we have learned that we need all hands on deck. And nobody got time to be pulling a pacifier out your mouth. Amen. <laughs> and nobody got time to be trying to burp you and change your pampers and you 45 years old. Ain't nobody got time for all that. Look to your neighbor and say, just get over yourself. Change your own pamper. Somebody say amen. I mean, you go and change your own self. I mean, get yourself together because ain't nobody got time to be wrestling with your little petty stuff. Amen. Somebody hurts your feelings. Okay, get over. Forgive them. See, there, there are some things. I know playing football, there were some things that, that a defensive back couldn't do to me. He tried. I got scars on my leg to prove it with some of them big linebackers. But there was something that a DB just couldn't do because he was like a net. All I needed was a step. That's 12 inches. It's a wrap. 12 inches. I was running 4.3 40-yard dashes, 6 foot 3, uh, uh, 185. My highest weight was 205. I wasn't going to be caught by nobody. 
And the coach said, all Curry need is one, uh, 12 inches of a gap. That, that's all he needs. It's just 12 inches. Once I got through, it's a wrap. So what God is telling me to tell you, all you need to get, do is get through it. <laughs> How many got it? Uh, uh, see, 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 the pain going to come, but if you can get through it, you get through them haters. You get through them people that don't want to see you succeed. So I had to go through my haters, but it was for my good. The last one, I had to forgive myself. I believe this was the most critical one that, that I had to, had to forgive myself because when you've been beat up for so long, uh, you know, the tendency is to start to think that you deserve it. You start to think that maybe that was supposed to happen. I know in dealing with victimizations, most of the people that have been victimized, raped, molested by pedophiles or controlled by someone. And when they rewind their life, they rewind their life and they start asking themselves these questions. Was it my fault? Did I really try to stop it? You see, the enemy can, can play with your mind so much that uh, if you've been victimized over and over again for several years or several months or several weeks, you have a real struggle. Because the first thing the devil want to play back is that you should have known better. You could have stopped it if you wanted to. Why you allow yourself to be taken advantage by that? He started to play those take back on you to say, kind of like what George Smiles went through, that she had to ask herself the question, you know, I, I, I wanted to stop it. I wanted, I wanted not to do this. I didn't want my daddy, my daddy to have sex with me over and over again from the ages of six all the way up until I was 16 years old. And, and you're not going to tell me. You're not going to tell me. That's why she keep writing books about her thoughts and her mind. The devil is still trying to get her to rewind so she can be in a victim position. And her fight is to consistently check her heart. And it's to make sure that she knows she's truly forgiven her father. So what the enemy would try to do is try to get you to play a role in it. Now, it's not just playing a role in it, but it is a, it is a permission to play a role in it. And if he can get you to agree that you played a role in it, then you remain as a victim. What, I, what God wants me to tell you, church, is that it wasn't your fault. You was forced to play a role in it. You did it, but you didn't want to do it. You was around it because you had to be. You asked for help, but nobody heard you. The pain comes greatest when it's someone that you love. God told me to tell you, how about forgiving yourself? How about telling yourself that what has happened to me is not really me? How about telling yourself that my mind was so wrapped up in doing foolishness that even when it appeared that I was doing it, my soul was going against it? God told me to tell you, forgive yourself. 
You got to learn how to forgive yourself. Well, Pastor, how do I do that? You do that by telling God to forgive the person that have hurt you. As you forgive others, God will forgive you. But I believe my biggest struggle over the years was making excuses and trying to get others to do for me that I refused to do for myself. And that's why I had to learn that anything I do, I overcheck it because I don't trust people. Because people, see, when people cause you so much pain, your tendency is to hear what they say. But more importantly, you watch what they do. So those of you in here this this morning, remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 where it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Forgive yourself. If you was drunk, forgive yourself. If you're a person that didn't do all the right things you know you need to do, forgive yourself. If you're a person that lied and cheat, maybe you did drugs and alcohol, maybe you're just a straight-up pimp, or maybe you're a straight-up whore, maybe you just did all kind of crazy stuff, forgive yourself. His grace is sufficient. Maybe you were so bad that you got mad when you looked yourself in the face because you couldn't stand to see who you are. God told me to tell you, forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for what you've done. Forgive yourself for what you didn't do. Forgive yourself for the pain and the strain. Forgive yourself for how bad you've been. God told me to tell you, you've forgiven everybody else. Now is your time to forgive yourself. You got to forgive yourself. You got to recognize that it's not what happened to you, but it's what's happening to you now. That God doesn't see you as you see yourself. As a Christian, we must model the Joseph concept, and that's be forgiven as Joseph was forgiven for his brethren who rejected him, kidnapped him, enslaved him, imprisoned him. Joseph forgave them, not only forgave them, but gave them prosperity of his wealth. We also must know that forgiveness is the mark of the Christian life. We can't say we're Christian and we're not willing to forgive. Forgiveness is contrary to the patterns of the world. The world go for an eye for an eye, but we go for love. We must be willing to forgive. Forgiveness is an act of will. It's not going to be an emotion. It's something that you decide to do. You make it up in your mind and say, I'm going to let that go. It's something you decide to do. You may not want to do it, but you decide to do it. Forgiveness. Are you willing to forgive those that hurt you? You had to go through it, church. But God told me to tell you it was for your good. God is forgiving. And as he forgive us, he also asks that we forgive others. So why don't you stand to your feet? And I want you, those of you that know that you've been through some things, those of you that know that Maybe you have aught in your heart right now. Maybe you're still going through some stuff. Maybe you still feel the pain. Maybe you haven't truly letting it go. Maybe you're still angry. You're frustrated. God want me to tell you that you had to go through it. But it was for your good. If it didn't kill you, it's going to build you. Maybe it was a stumbling block, but you got to make it out of stepping stone. I want you to know that it was all about his blood. It was about his blood. Say, I had to go through it, but it was for my good. Hallelujah. See, it was for the blood. Just put the blood of Jesus on there. Hallelujah.